My name is Thomas George Lazar, De Ohaga, Two Roads. I come from a family of Mohawk chiefs, peacemakers and peacekeepers, warriors and man-eaters, lacrosse magicians, tobacco salesmen, gangsters, shaman, shit disturbers and survivors. But instead of growing up around these heroes, I grew up on the East Mountain of Hamilton, Ontario, where a whole other tribe of madness prevailed. I'm a living, breathing lie, an embarrassment, a married man's mistake, and a young girl's only chance to hop a fence out of town and escape into freedom. The truth robbed me of my golden heart. I'm 64 years old. And 10 years ago, I found out from a complete stranger that the people who raised me, the loving people that raised me, Bunny and George Wilson, were not actually my parents and that I was adopted, illegally adopted. Um, later, I found out driving my cousin Jane Lazar home from one of my grandson's birthday parties. Uh, I was driving her home and I said, Janie, I found out a short time ago that mom and dad aren't really my mom and dad. If you can ever tell me anything about this, would you please? And she turned to me and said, Tom, I don't know how to tell you this. I'm sorry, and I hope you forgive me, but I'm your mother. Janie has been in my life my entire life. She's been the uh, image at the corner of the photograph right against the edge of the frame. Never really in my life, but always close to it. Um, my, my mother, who I knew as my cousin Jane Lazar, is Mohawk from Ganawage. My father, uh, Louis Bova, was Mohawk from Ganawage. I grew up thinking I was a big, puffy, sweaty Irish guy, when I'm in fact uh, a Mohawk from Ganawage. My belief, of course, is that we're all born artists. The ages of two, three, four, we all sing songs freely, we all dance, we make up stories, we act out characters, and we draw with absolutely no inhibition. And as I started to paint, I started to feel that three-year-old come out of me. And anybody who works to be an artist is working to get back to that three or four year old self that we sadly left behind once we walk through the doors of school. These colors and these images are, are my ancestors screaming to be heard. It was 15 years ago that my daughter said to me, Dad, you have to stop painting like this. This is cultural appropriation. And being a knucklehead from Hamilton, I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't know what that means. She said, it's when you take someone else's culture and use it for your own benefit. And I said, well, this is just what's coming out of me. I've known Tom for quite a while, I guess since uh, around the late 70s, uh, mostly through music. I was in, in Hamilton uh, booking bands and, and bars and, and part of the music scene in Hamilton at the time. Uh, I started moving towards art as Tom's uh, music career evolved and um, I think he started painting sometime in the early 90s uh, and, and painting on his amplifiers and guitars and I thought that was interesting. Also, he used to visit me at my studio when I lived in Montreal. And so we used to have conversations not only about uh, music, but also uh, about art as well. And then I think it was around 2015 uh, when Tom uh, discovered his uh, indigeneity and he went deep into uh, visual arts, into painting. And so he invited me to his studio, which a uh, small studio on, on James North and Hamilton. And I uh, visited him there. I thought it was really remarkable what he was doing and, and just trying to, let's say, negotiate his way uh, through visual art as a tool to understand his own history, his identity, where he came from, where it might be going to. 
It's the desire to get home. Ganawage sits on the south shore of the St. Lawrence Seaway, 20 minutes outside of Montreal, Quebec, just across the Mercier Bridge. The dream that I had since I was five or six years old, and it was a reoccurring dream that uh, I can't tell you, countless amount of times it stirred me in my sleep, was I'm standing um, as a young boy on the side of a, a, a river, a body of water, water's going by, it's nighttime, and I'm looking across at a piece of land that's uh, shadowed, shadowed in the, in the darkness, deep greens and deep blues, and I don't know how to get across the river. And the man who I knew as my Uncle John, who turns out to be my grandfather, he comes to me and he says, get on my back, I'll take you across the river. So I get on John Lazar's back and I start to go across the river and as we get about halfway across the river, he morphs, transforms, shapeshifts into a giant turtle. And suddenly I'm on the back of this giant turtle and he starts to lift off the water, almost like he's gonna fly. And every time the dream ends right there. I think that that's some shape of blood memory itself. That was me. That was my blood recognizing that I was not home yet. And that dream was showing me the way to get there. As an artist, all you can possibly do is try to bring somebody face to face with your work for a moment just to be in the moment. This piece, uh, this piece represents a culture rising out of an attempt at assassination. This vibrancy, these colors, these crows on these warriors' heads are overcoming uh, the rape, murder, and robbery of its culture. Maybe this is a reflection that we need to look at. They tried to bury us, but they didn't know that we were seeds. So this is, this is the indigenous culture rising again through art, as Louis Riel said we would. These are uh, nuns' habits, and inside these habits are the names of children found buried uh, on the property of residential schools. It's, a, it's an intense piece of work. It was an intense piece of work to create, to take these children's names and the dates they died, some just infants, and write them into these habits was not an easy task. It was not uh, something that didn't come with a weight that stayed with me and stays with me today. I paint for the lost children buried in the ground of abandoned residential schools. I paint for the generations of my family who worked the high steel building North America into the sky. I paint for my family who filled out their wills at their kitchen tables and went into the woods to fight the Canadian Army in the war we call Oka Crisis in 1991. I paint for my mother who from the age of six attended day residential school her teacher told her every day to stand up with the rest of the Mohawk children in her class and take a good look around the room. Take a good look at each other because you're looking at the last Indians that this world is ever going to see. This painting is called Ganawage, The Long Road Home. It's a self-portrait. The two faces indicate the two worlds that I come from. Ganawage where my blood is from and the place that I was robbed and taken to is Hamilton, Ontario. Before I got my Mohawk name, I painted this. My Mohawk name is Deo Hahaga, which is two roads. It represents me perfectly. This is my favorite painting. I hope it never sells. Um, I hope that it hangs in my living room to the day I die. My mother believed that she was one of the last Indians. On her 80th birthday, she told this story to me, her son, my kids, her grandkids, and my two grandsons, her great-grandchildren. 
That's four generations of Mohawk. So she is not the last Indian. She's a survivor. And through her, I stand as a result of this country's greatest sin. This is uh, titled The Warrior. And like um, a lot of my paintings, uh, I try to make them colorful and inviting and loving, which is the juxtaposition of the theory of the dead Indian. Uh, the dead Indian is a uh, product of colonialism. The dead Indian is the noble warrior, often Lakota. Uh, the dead Indian is put in a safe place behind glass with animals that have become extinct. Uh, the dead Indian is mocked in cartoons and TV shows and laughed at by fools. So this painting, the warrior, is a warrior of love, a warrior of the ability to be able to do the right thing. And because of his vibrant colors and his good nature, is, uh, is a warrior against colonialism's dead Indian. I've been writing songs, lyrics, since I was 14 years old. Words are a part of the creative process for me. These words I was actually trying to read before we did this little filming here, and I couldn't make a lot of them out. But uh, in the past, I've opened up my computer, or I've printed out documents that I've been working on for my new book, Blood Memory. And I take those words and I start transcribing them into the paintings. And then I kind of leave that behind and it turns into a stream of consciousness. Uh, once again, elaborating on what I had written originally. And then uh, I have found myself because I figured what I just wrote into these paintings is actually better than what I wrote in my computer for the book. So I have to go back to the paintings and transcribe from the paintings back onto my computer or onto the page what I, uh, what I wrote in that moment. I mean, this is, this is our search, right? I mean, the words, the detail in these, this is, this is grasping the moment that we're in. This is... Uh, the creative moment, you know, we have to savor that. Starting in the 2000s, uh, there has been a greater awareness and really a renaissance uh, among Indigenous artists in Canada in particular. And I think Tom is part of that, uh, that voice in this century that is talking, uh, uh, referring to their history and their culture how it fits into uh, the discourse of today, trying to understand how that was almost uh, eliminated through history, and also trying to imagine what the future of their culture might be based on what's happening now and based on history. It's about going forward, I think, in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, and there are many artists, uh, a number of them that I've worked with, uh, but right across Canada, also in film, in literature, in theater, and visual arts as well. So this is a really exciting time, uh, I think, for, for Indigenous art in Canada, and, and Tom is part of that uh, movement. The eyes originally were to be coming from, you know, not this planet, that's for sure. They were, they were universal understanding, universally understood. Um, people try to get their own interpretation for the eyes. Uh, I always have this line running down them so that people assume that it's a highway, it's a road, you know, which, which is not wrong. Um, it's, it's for interpretation, but I find that it's a good basis for everywhere else I'm going to go. I even put human eyes in my crows. The only eyes that I don't put, the only subjects I don't put human eyes in are, are the fish that I draw. So it's an important uh, place for me to start. And, and I don't sketch things out. I don't approach this canvas with a pencil and delicately, you know, sketch out where everything is going to be. It drives my wife crazy. She says, how do you do this? Why, do you, why don't you use a pencil and sketch out your paintings? It's, I go with actual oil and I start painting. 
and uh, I do the outlines. And a great place to start is with the eyes, for me. And after that, I paint with my hands. So all this is, is all painted in with my hands, and then the detail is with uh, oil pen. Let me put some sugar where they put salt. The mistakes you made aren't all your fault. Let me seal your scars and ease your mind. Turn your deep blue heart into the loving kind. How does it feel to be lying by yourself? You're out, oh, you deal. Tell me, how does it feel? Faded Memories of Home is an installation of nine school desks. The installation is to represent the loss of identity, the loss of color, the loss of language, the loss of love and the sense of family, the cruel joke made by the churches and the Canadian government against indigenous children who were robbed from their homes and forced into these schools. The nine desks all have photographs of families burned into the tops, including my great-grandfather, Chief Peter Lazar. And as you move back in the desks, the images start to disappear, start to fade, representing the loss of all those ingredients that make us full human beings. And then there's two nuns, eight-foot nuns, that are uh, standing at the front of the classroom. And uh, a film that I put together from uh, National Film Board, clips, pictures of Disneyland, pictures of cartoons representing the dead Indian that I talked about earlier. And this exhibit has been shown at McMaster University. It's been shown at uh, Stratford Festival for a season. And uh, most recently at Queen's University uh, and on Tyndanega Mohawk Territory. Um, I hope this uh, piece continues uh, to travel because uh, I'm learning that the impact that it has on people, both indigenous and non-indigenous, is, uh, is mighty and it leaves us wanting to continue a conversation. And if you really wanna know what this gets down to, why I stand on stage and, and read from my books and sing the songs I do and why I write the books that I do and why I create this art, it's to, to hopefully have, create something that resonates with people enough that they start their own conversation, that they don't have to be told by the government or the churches or corporations to have the conversation, that they don't have to be told by news outlets to have the conversation, that art, art creates a conversation that needs to happen in this country.